good. Thanks a lot. Boys, man, appreciate you, you guys all doing this. Um, I know, especially now, it's, it's getting busier now with everybody reopening. So, especially grateful. Um, obviously, Charlie and Jamie, I know you guys, I know you guys for a little bit, but uh, Durham and Jacob, it's great to meet you guys and um, gratitude for you guys for, for doing this too and hopping on. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Awesome. Well, we'll go live now. We'll take questions from, from people from all over. Um, if they ask them. Um, but I guess, you know, because we've had two big communities coming together. We've got Core Advantage, we've got Strength Culture, and then we've got Orphic Education, which is kind of this, you know, three, four-year-old company, not as old as you guys and established as you guys. So for those listening who may not know, Orphic Education, an education company that delivers Cert 3s and 4s and, and partner with actually gyms like yourselves to deliver it. And... Jacob, Durham, you guys at Core Advantage, you're, you guys are responsible for, you know, coaching some of Australia's best field-based sport athletes. And then Jamie and Charlie, you guys powerlifting and even some athletes um, and hold that down with, you know, multiple title holders and all that. And I wonder for both of you guys, and I'll ask, I'll ask the Core Advantage guys first, how have you guys like been able to adjust the programming and prescription volume loads for your athletes and clients now, because like I talked about in the last webinar Wednesday, 2011 NFL lockout, we saw a huge spike in Achilles tendon ruptures and Achilles tendon injuries, right? I imagine we're already starting to see these flare ups from this big acute spike in load and volume. How do you guys think about managing that and mitigating that injury? Sure. Great question. Look, I think the first thing is actually education. It's educating the athletes that we're coming into a deload and you, you're going to need to do every single thing you can do to minimise that deload. Uh, so if you don't do that, everything else is, the deck is on the Titanic, it's not going to work. So we went pretty hard on educating that. We did a webinar about it, uh, the Art of the Reload. Um, Jacob made... Um, 8 million videos each day as an athlete lockdown program. So basically there was something for everyone every day. Uh, and then individually with our athletes, we uh, did Zoom, Zoom calls with all of them. And we just said, so we really laid that foundation of the why, So you really need to care about this now and you really need to maintain your, your levels. Um, and then we just utilized whatever we could. And so in some cases, all people had was land and gravity. Um, but land and gravity is still useful. You can still maintain some tissue adaptations, um, particularly if you ramp up the volume and the reps and the time under tension. Um, so we just sort of did our best. Um, and the, the athletes were great with it. They, they got it. Um, we've got a very uh, select group of athletes. So the kind of people that train with us are the kind of people that get it. So it makes our job pretty easy. Um, so, yeah, it, it worked well. And then the the second part of that is now that we're in the return is having athletes go, oh, I'm, you know, training started, I can just do whatever I like, but having them aware that there's a period of time they need to continue the ramp up into competitive training because there's yeah. it's hard to replicate that competition and that competitiveness and that extra intensity you get when you're out there with your teammates or your opposition. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure that over the next sort of four to six weeks, they're also pretty cognizant of that fact and they're smoothing their way into things as well. Yeah, um, particularly because they're so excited about being back in the gym, like, and they just want to lift yeah. everything. They're, they're, they're so they're so happy to be there. Uh, one of the things we've learned over the years with with field and um, and court athletes is that you've actually got to dial them back a fair bit more than than they realise. So the, the standard thought process is, uh, I know I normally squat 140 kilos. Um, I'll make these things. I normally squat 100. Uh, therefore, I'll just come in at 70 percent of that. And I'll just squat 70. And, and we're good. And what we've found is that with, uh, with athletes, that's often um, still too much uh, because they'll get really significant adductor magnus soreness uh, and just general other back tweaks and, and so forth. Uh, so we try and teach them that instead of thinking of what you usually do, so you're picking up chapter seven of a book that you're reading, you've got to take it back a few chapters uh, and go from what have you been doing lately rather than rather than down from what have you been, what, what's your best? work up from what have you done the last um, 10 days. Uh, so, so we've dialed people back a lot more. They all hate us at the moment. So they're all thinking it's just rubbish because we're not letting them, them squat as heavy. Uh, but we found that's far and away the best way. How much do you quantify it? Like 
you know, or is it, or is it based on individual to individual or like, how, how can you, as a measuring stick, so people listening can kind of like, yeah. all right, how much do I regulate my load and volume? I think the best way to regulate it, I think in that first week, particularly, uh, is just uh, that, that idea of it's not, a, it's, it's getting just enough load to expose the body to the positions that they haven't been getting into with some time under tension, some load that will actually stimulate that first little adaptation. Um, so that might be 30 or 40 kilos for some athletes on a squat, for instance, who, who had a 100 kilo squat normally. It's just getting back, it's just re-establishing that movement capacity under a tiny bit of load. Um, so that's our first phase is always just re-acclimatize yourself to some load. Got it. Um, and then, and then and you kind of just build up from there. We're a little agile with it. So it's like, how would you feel last time? I felt great. All right, let's push a little more. How would you feel last time? I was in agony. Okay, let's maybe just dial that back or hit that again. Um, so uh, we're, not as, we're not as scientific as the strength culture boys. They've, uh, they've got this stuff dialed in a, a lot more. Um, but yeah, we kind of just do it based on kind of a read and react sort of way of doing it. All right, interesting. What about you boys? Oh, yeah, I'll... Oh, yeah. Jamie can go. I was going to say, um, yeah, I don't think we're as scientific as Durham Maha makes us out to be because we go a lot off feel as well. I know you, you put in the uh, running sheet about RPE, so auto-regulating. So a lot of it for us is that, um, which was just, as Durham said, being a bit subjective with, did you pull up really, really sore? Maybe we dial it back a little bit. Um, but naturally, just if the athlete has been just a little bit detrained from doing home training or no training at all, um, the RPE system will sort of auto-regulate their loads naturally for the individual. And Jamie. Yeah. So uh, we definitely take a, we, we call it a reactive approach to most of our programming decisions. We let the athlete sort of dictate what happens on the day. Yeah, we set our guidelines of volume and intensity with RPE prescriptions for intensity or, or total amount of sets that we need to hit. However, the athlete will pretty much, an educated athlete will dictate the, the overall load selection for that individual session and for the most part, the entire training program. That's how we program. Um, the thing to consider with us and, and mainly our cohort of athletes is it's powerlifting, it's strength sports. Um, so we can probably have uh, a little bit more lenience uh, coming in through this phase because they've actually had no barbell training or some athletes have had no barbell training in the last two, three, four months as a result of the COVID closure and complete gym closure. Um, unfortunately, uh, land and gravity for a, an athlete that can squat 250 plus for reps. <laughs> you get your family on your back. <laughs> yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite have the same intensity for some of those more running and field-based sport guys who can do uh, more body weight selected things. So we've had to maybe dial things back a little bit more and just sort of ramp us in. Um, the, the, the literature on this sort of stuff, like the acute to chronic workload ratio, yes, yes. Um, is, a fam is a fantastic place to start. Some of the uh, objective, I know you asked about like objective, can you quantify the amount of volume or intensity that we need to sort of reduce or, or leak back in? Some of the data, like there is data out there. I think it's like 1.6 times um, your AC ratio is sort of what's recommended. However, we don't really... Uh, subscribe to the objective data too much on that. I think the overall concept of not spiking training load is important and being cognizant of the previous maybe four, six, even eight weeks and sort of using that to, to sort of guide how fast you're going to accelerate training again. Um, one of the analogies that we used is, is, is a jet needs to start at zero and accelerate into its free flowing speed of sound speeds. The same thing should always happen with your training. If you've gone from nothing, you need to accelerate into that period again. You can't just go zero to 100 and expect the jet to still be in its same condition. It has to go through that takeoff uh, and that acceleration moment. So that, as, J as Jacob alluded to, it, it could be a, a three, four, five, even a six-week period of reduced loads and reduced volumes and reduced intensities. Um, but you're better off to take the conservative route with reintroduction because aggressive load increases is probably the number one risk factor for injuries across any endeavor. So uh, you want to want to be a little bit more cognizant of, 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 of slowly leaking all these things back in um, play the long game. Strength is never built over weeks. It's built over years. So if you, if you keep that macro view in mind, you should be all right. I think one of the big differences between our two populations as well 
is that um, we can, in twofold, we can play around with plyometrics during the lockdown. So we, the plyometrics are a lot more beneficial and helpful to our athletes as opposed to the strength athletes. You could do, you know, your reactive bounding and stuff like that, but that's not going to mimic deadlifting and squatting, whereas that is going to have good transfer to, say, basketball or volleyball. And then in the reload, but on the reload as well, we need to be quite conservative with plyometric loading because our athletes are then going to be on court or on field. So their sport coach is going to want to be going, quick, we've got four weeks of the first game. Let's smash it every week. Let's get all the sprints and all the running, all the scrimmage work in. And then we go and do that plyometric training in the, training in the gym as well. And they're just going to be overloaded to the max with all this high intensity competitive type plyometric loading. So it's, it's, it's a useful tool during the offload that they can do from home. You know, if you program with video tutorials and if they're experienced with it beforehand. But then when they actually get in the gym, we actually need to dial that back a bit, start ramping up the strength and let the sport take care of the plyometric loading. Whereas with the strength athlete, the plyometrics uh, have, a, have a place, but it's significantly less valuable when it comes to squatting 250 kilos for reps, for example. So um, it's an interesting um, difference of, of how to go about it. I think the interesting commonality though, is that we're both probably uh, fairly scared about tendons having problems. Yeah, you don't want the, you don't want any overuse now. Because <laughs> because yeah, the muscles will the muscles will pick up the game relatively quickly. The nervous system will come back relatively quickly. But that tendon adaptation that's going to be uh, it's a slow process. I mean, I've been explaining to to the athletes some of the cells in your tendons they've never even done um, they've never even played a game of sport before. Those cells are brand new, right. you know, untested cells. Like they're just not used to it. So it's going to take some time for your body to get uh, get that adaptation up. I reckon it'll be the same for you guys with heavy loads. That'll be... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. Yeah. I've um, definitely... So one thing we typically do when we're writing blocks is we write our micro cycle and we keep volume the same throughout the whole meso cycle. But something that I've just introduced coming back from the lockdown was just progressing sets through this whole block for a lot of my guys. So just ease, ease them in first couple of weeks, add a little bit more weeks three and four, and then a little bit more weeks five and six, which is something I don't normally do because... Um, and I don't think Jamie does either, but for this instance, I have made that adjustment just to, as we said, progress them into training. And I've got a few guys that are actually doing junior nationals in 14 weeks from now. So I've got to sort of tailor their training to get them ready for a, a competition block where they are going to be you know, in five, six, seven weeks time, pretty much going balls to the wall. <laughs> Um, can I jump in with a question for you guys? I'm really curious. Say you've got someone who's got a max squat of 240 and they haven't been doing any lifting over the road. They're coming completely cold off of lifting. Um, what do the first three workouts look like in terms of like, how are you, where do you, where do you go? I'm fascinated to see where you guys actually start and, and build it in. Yeah, so typically started most guys um, a six or a seven RPE, so three to four reps from failure. Um, and depending, as I said, on their phase of training, if they are some, one of those people that is going to be doing junior nationals and they have to compete in 14 weeks' time, um, then the rep range will be pretty strength-specific, so somewhere between three to six reps to start exposing them to that stimulus. Um, but, yeah, if they're just a general, like some of the guys are just a bit more hypertrophy-focused, general pop, just want to build some muscle there, I just – I've started two, two, three, four reps out from failure, and I'll just progress from there. I have avoided sort of RPE nines right now and just don't see the need. If they're coming off completely novice, you know, three months of split squats and push-ups. Um, so that's basically where I've started them. For now, um, the other what the other exactly good thing with uh, so uh, so wait so yeah well that it's again as we said we're very reactive so if they're a 240 squatter and we've got three months of no training all they've been doing is some uh, walking some split squats and some mm -hmm. push ups and some real body weight stuff um, then the RPE we give them the necessary tools to regulate their training to ensure that they're, if we've got a, say, a single at RPE 7 to regulate their training so that they're three reps away from failure. Um, for someone who hasn't trained for three months, it might only be like 170 kilos, 180 kilos. So it's quite... But I, I tend to see that strength return pretty quickly. Um, it seems to be like three to six weeks, they start to get back to sort of moderate strength uh, performance levels. Mm. Yeah, the, mm. the, the bookmark or the bookend of uh, competition definitely dictates a lot of the decision making. But if you don't have a competition, the good thing, again, with our very controlled environment is our exercise selection can very easily dictate the overall load intensity 
selected. If you put a tempo, slap a four-second eccentric on a barbell squat, all of a sudden that 160, 170 is going to look more like 130, 140. If you put a pause in there, if you put a, a concentric tempo on it, you can drill, you can bring that all the way down to like 100 kilos and it still feels like that RPE mm-hmm. six to seven where we're still getting some form of adaptive stimulus for the tissue. So um, exercise selection can dictate a lot of that as well. But for somebody, a lot of Charlie's list that are doing competitions towards the back end of the year, uh, that needs to be taken into consideration because ultimately they are athletes. They have a competition. They have a date. Aggressive. We need to prepare them for that. Um, so, yeah. You got to be a bit yeah. more aggressive with those ones. Potentially. Um, it's a, yeah. yeah, not too aggressive. Like, it doesn't, you don't have to be that aggressive. But um, again, it's just being, as Durham said, sort of getting a lot of feedback week to week off the athlete and just making sure that you are sort of in that sweet spot for volume where we're not doing too much where we're going to, you know, destroy them and, get, you know, potentially put them at risk of getting injured. But, doing enough to actually drive some progression that, so that we hopefully get a, a, a good performance at, at our comp. Uh, the one I'm thinking of is junior nationals in 14 weeks. So um, yeah, which is a, a sort of a, you know, I've got only a limited time to work with, but RPE and just auto regulating the loads helps quite a lot. Um, it just adjusts their training intensities to suit that individual on that given day, uh, taking into account, uh, into account their readiness to train. Mm. Cool. I'm glad. Sorry, side with the questions. No, that's perfect. Yeah, that's, that's right. No, that's like, if you guys have questions for each other, this is just a conversation, you know, yeah. just mm. ask well, them. I, I have another one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, go for it. Go. Um, where do you see the majority of your, like, where is your soreness hotspot for, uh, for lower body? We see adductor magnets is always yeah. on Riddle Earth. Or is it the same for you guys? Adductors. Adductors. We've discussed this, Jamie and I, before. Adductors for squatting, it seems to always be adductors. Um, and we've talked about, I know Greg Knuckles has done, written some, uh, an article on, uh, looked at some research that showed that below 90 degrees of hip flexion, adductor magnus is the main hip extensor. Mm-hmm. And as we get closer to, Hip extension, then that's when the glutes are, are more uh, the dominant hip extensor. But that, so it does seem to be, yeah, if you ask most guys, like, yeah, my adductors or my inner thigh, they point to the inner thigh, just seems to be where they are. A lot of guys point sore. to their adductors and they say their hamstrings are sore. <laughs> yeah. Well, it could be classified. <laughs> so, um, yeah, definitely, definitely that. Yeah, okay. sure. I wonder how do you guys, a strength culture, you know, you have all this max lifting, maximal lifting that you have to prepare for. How did you guys adjust each client over this time um, to kind of still maintain that stimulus and reduce as much detraining as possible? That would have been a juggling act with each different client. How did you guys think about it? Yeah. So really it was dependent on one. Well, first we have to analyze, do they have equipment? So if most, some, you know, it's funny, powerlifters will find equipment. Like they want to lift weights. They somehow all manage to find a friend's gym or in their garage or get equipment. So if they had equipment, awesome. We could, you know, tailor the program to hopefully stay as specific as possible. If they didn't, um, obviously the main goal would have been keeping around as much hypertrophy and as much muscle as possible. So even if they had some kettlebells, dumbbells, just doing reps close, uh, sets close to failure to, you know, um, keep those adaptations around. Um, but the other thing too was I also just, if we do take into consideration that strength is a time game and most guys that in this for the long haul, that if they were feeling a bit deflated or motivated, I was just being really a lot more gentle on them and just, you know, do things you enjoy. Um, a lot of guys are playing video games, going for walks. Some guys started running a little bit and like, I, I, maybe they weren't prepared to run, but it's also, it was a traumatic, you know, a collective traumatic experience that a lot of people going through. People were feeling a bit off. They were working from home, didn't have jobs. So like to push training down their throats as well probably not the best move as a coach right now. Um, so yeah, it was either they, if they had equipment, train as normal and or tailor their training to as normal as possible. If they didn't, it was potentially hypertrophy. But let's focus on keeping as much muscle around. If not, it was sort of just enjoy the time and uh, have a bit of a break. The other, the other big thing there, as Durham said at the very start, a lot of education based things for um, as we entered COVID um, and entered those closures uh, regarding like retention of muscle. Um, it actually, I, I think, uh, Charlie might, might correct me here, but I think it's like one seventh of the amount of volume. As one long nine. As we take one nine. It was one, one nine. Uh, that was the research. Yeah, it showed one ninth of the volume. Yeah. Um, 
in, ter in terms of like hard sets per week um, can be enough to retain muscle. Um, up and for to our 30, strength, up yeah. to 36 weeks, it showed. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah. So, it, 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 yeah. So if you if you educate your client, because like everybody goes through it, like somebody like yeah, you go on a holiday, a three week holiday. Oh, I'm going to lose all my gains. Like I'm going to come home. I'm going to be a skinny guy. Like, it, but it's all it, it's almost like it doesn't really matter. Like the, the body is not that regressive in its form, particularly for something uh, when we when we talk about like um, like a, a, a tissue. Like it's not just going to to catabolize a tissue across a two three week period. So like. If we can keep some form of stimulus in there um, and educate on that, mainly educating, again, the RPE system here is, is a really easy tool. Learning what failure is and then learning how to get somewhere within proximity of that uh, above an RPE 6 will generally, um, will generally help you minimise those losses and that regressive um, adaptation of non training stimulus or non-progressive training stimulus but a bit of education on the side of going through that whole process that charlie went through there um helps a lot because once you start to learn those things and start to see the research and realize all, all of a sudden your body's not this fragile thing that's just going to deteriorate um all of a sudden a two month three month slowing down of training is not the end of the world so um education is a big thing there as well i what Go I was going to ask. I was going to ask a question for the boys. Just, um, did you find that as well? So one thing I found is a fair few of my guys that they sort of, yeah, were a bit demotivated, maybe feeling a bit flat, depressed, stuff, just because of what was going on. Did you find that you were a bit more lenient with some of your guys if they did want to stray from normal sort of training? Um, yeah. yeah. Hundred, hundred, um, I think we all yeah. felt it. Yeah. You know, uh, I think it, it was just a just. It was that thing of let's just keep you doing stuff that makes you feel good. Let's just maintain a bit of running work, a bit of load. Uh, doesn't have to be perfect. Just keep on track a little bit, um, and particularly uh, just keep doing stuff outdoors. I think that was one of our biggest pushes was get get some daylight into your eyeballs and onto your skin. You know that'll that'll help you feel good. Like just keep outdoors a bit as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Because people's circadian rhythms just went to rubbish. Oh, mine, mine's still terrible. Is that mine really? Is, mine, I'm jacked up. I was. I went to. I had my early start on Tuesday morning. I had my 5:30 wake up for a 6 a.m. Open the door, um, and even that night I couldn't sleep until about 12:30 yeah. last night. Like I was just like, what the? Yeah, like it's just yeah. still. No, nah, I'm gonna. I need a, a full week of the same wake ups, looking yeah. at the sun, get in the eyes. Yeah, get in the eyeball. <laughs> I've got my first. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got my first early one tomorrow, and I'm a bit nervous because I'm the same. I haven't really been able to get to sleep at a decent hour or so but it'll we'll kick back into rhythm it should be all right yeah. we took a we took very much a minimal effective dose same sort of thing with our athletes like look if yeah. you can just sprint once a week do some agility stuff once a week and get one maybe two bodyweight workouts plus keep getting outside go for walks with the dog get to the park stuff like that stay active yeah, yeah. and so there's the, the mental health thing took a lot more priority than it normally does whereas we're a lot more about well, you know, you're in your normal routine, life's good, you're playing your sport, everything's happy, let's focus on where you want to be. Whereas um, during these periods, like, okay, let's just, let's just maintain as much of a floor as you feel comfortable maintaining and then we'll ramp back into when things start. So now the questioning is coming in where everyone's attending the gym, welcome back, what's your last three weeks been like? Well, yeah, I fell off the, fell off the bandwagon and went, all right, well, remember that, dial your lifting back, dial your plyometrics back, take it easy for your first weeks back in the gym, don't go... You know, if you didn't do the work beforehand, don't go going crazy now and causing all those tendon problems and adductor problems a month from now. So, And I mean, we, we also tried to, I'm always keen to push the competitive button. So one of, one of my big themes with everyone was, all right, everyone else is going to slip back. While they're slipping back, you're going to push up. We so the differential yeah. is going to be, is gonna, like this is your time to overtake people and crush them. So there was a bit of that sense as well of, it's kind of your go, this is your go time. And if you can have the mental fortitude to maintain that consistency, you're going to be in the great spot when we come back out of this. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, you throw that in and you, and you, and you reiterate that. Um, it's kind of like you go hard with the inspiration, but you'd be soft with the, you know, telling people off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, I think so it was for every, for every athlete, sorry, Joe, for every athlete that we oh, yeah. had that was a little bit kind of flat and didn't want to go, we probably had two athletes that were like, let's do this. You know, I've got a countdown. Who knows? You know, season's only four weeks away at any theoretical point. So they were 
driving just as hard, actually doing more than they normally would, which was fantastic. So, mm. you know, there's there swings and roundabouts. Mm. I think there was definitely a thing that I noticed is just you sort of start to see why people train and why people lift. And some people like me, honestly, I just enjoy going to the gym. I like being in the atmosphere, I like the music's loud. There's other dudes lifting and girls lifting heavy weights and just doing backpack and push-ups and backpack <laughs> split squats doesn't really float my boat. And I'd rather just have a break and just get back to training when the gym uh, reopens. So, mm. you know, you can't really force training upon someone that wants to just uh, do that. So then I was like, all right, perfect. Just do, do what you enjoy then. Like take mm. your dog for walks and go for a run. Go there. Yeah. I think steps was also a big one. We tried to push with a lot of people, just get your step count up as well and just get moving. Cause um, I found being at home just how sedentary you are. Like some days the whole day would go by and I've done two and a half thousand steps, 2000 steps. So um, walking was just a big thing. Just get outside and walk. I had my watch tell me for the first, I've got an Apple watch. And yeah. it never, ever told me I've got to do stuff because I'm always way over everything I need to do. Standing, steps, exercise, like I'm always way over. And all of a sudden it's telling me, oh, you've got to do more. And uh, <laughs> so I was a yeah. bit, yeah, like it's so different. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's I really take, you sort of take for granted, like being out at work and on the gym floor, how much you, you move and how many steps you get in. Um, and then when that's gone, how easy it is to slip behind. And just sit at a desk all day, sit on the couch and do nothing. Man, and I think the commonality between well, what I'm hearing you guys say is that you're treating your clients and athletes as people first. You both talked about mental yeah, health. 100%. You talked about do what you enjoy or don't do nothing. <laughs> Can you guys just talk about the fact that we got, you guys are going person first, athlete second, player last, like that, that common phrase that we, we say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, uh, this is something that Charlie has taught me. For anybody that knows uh, my personality, it's it's a it's a hundred or nothing. It's it's literally run through a brick wall and just repeatedly run through it until you're tired. Stop and just don't do anything. And then Charlie was the first person that's ever taught me to, uh, in those periods of my time where I have decided to not work or to not pursue goals or constructive things, um, to not be down on myself for taking rest. Um, and it's actually something that I have now passed on to pretty much every single client and athlete that comes into me. The, the, the idea that if you decide to play a video game, fucking enjoy the hell yeah. out of the video yeah. game. Like yeah. actually just be in it. Like yes. forget everything else. Just be like, I've decided to do this. I'm actually just going to spend the next three hours of my life yeah. wasting away on this battlefield shooting fake players like that's that's my decision to do it's no longer oh i should be getting that work done or oh, because then you don't end up one you don't get any work done but also two you don't enjoy the the rest time um so educating this it is something that charlie has taught me but educating guys that if you want to take time off if you want to take some slow time like that's fine like be okay with that decision like it's perfectly good don't be hard on yourself like it, it's a perfect time to do that Charlie and I had a joke, like we're never ever going to get another period in our, in our working lives where we have half a job. Like we literally had half a job. Like why not enjoy the, just having half a job for that period of, I don't have to get up at 6am anymore. I can get up at 9am. Like it, it's fine. Like that's, it's just what life's given us. So we can do that. So passing that idea on to clients was big for us, but um, we, we have, like, it's not a saying, but like a, just a belief as, as coaches of strength culture that, Results matter, but not as much as the client experience. And I think that is important for everything. Um, the client experience is as, if not more important than the results themselves. So if, if your clients are enjoying themselves and they're having a good time and, and, and they actually, they want to be there and they want to be involved in, this, in, in the training and in the, in the journey of, of whatever, whether it's COVID or training in general, um, that enjoyment factor will mean you have positive and better results anyway. If you've got a negative person that doesn't want to be there and doesn't want to be involved, like all of a sudden expect half ass reps, half ass sets, half ass analysis, half ass everything. And then you're going to get half ass results. So we'll always push client experience above all else. And, and this was just another example of, of a great time for that to, to take priority and, and really take on the individual sort of, what, does, what do you want to do right now? Because we'll support and find a structure that works for you. And as Charlie said, if that means no training for the next two weeks, fucking no, no training. When you want to do push-ups, let me know and I'll, I'll teach you how to do push-ups so that your shoulders don't hurt. Like that was, that was literally, yeah. Client experience always 
uh, and try not to be too hard on yourself. Be a bit more forgiving for your for your decisions because ultimately we're all doing good things anyway. So you don't need to be that hard on yourself. Tim Urban um, is the author of a really good blog online called Wait But Why, where he just yeah, digs into that. things and goes really deep on stuff. Yeah. And he is a world-class procrastinator. And so he said, well, I'm a world-class procrastinator. I'm going to procrastinate by learning what is the psychology of procrastination. <laughs> and what he learned was yeah. that one, and I've forgotten what the term was, but it was the dark forest of procrastination where you're not having fun, not getting things done, but you're just wasting time and being regretful about it. Mm. And so it speaks to that thing about James. Like, look, if you're going to go out and go for an extra run today because you just want to get outside and the weather's nice, don't beat yourself up. Go out and enjoy it or go play that video game for three hours. Or eat just, that yeah, donut. In, enjoy it. Eat that donut. Don't be regretful. Enjoy it. But no, you can't do that four times a day because then you're going to yeah. start slipping backwards. But if you're going to do it, do it once or twice. Really enjoy it. Make the most of that experience and then get back to you know, training or work or whatever it is on the other side of that. Um, so it's about not, not sort of... It's about, yeah, enjoy your, your, your downtime and work hard when you need to work hard, but don't, you know, drift don't, in the middle. Don't there. cloud the two together. Yeah. And, exactly, yeah. You just, get, you just end up feeling depressed at the end, like, oh, I've done nothing. Uh. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just not. It's I, not I think um, there's a movie called Green Book, and I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's a really, really good film. But he, he does everything. He's like, I'm Italian, and I do everything to the fullest. So when I eat, I eat hard. When I sleep, I sleep hard. And just like, it's just like, yeah, just do things. When I watch TV, I'm watching like TV. Just be, be invested in what you're doing, no matter what it is. And I thought that was a really like cool, just concept. Yeah, I like that that's the message you took out of that movie about <laughs> no, no, racism. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. no but, <laughs> I personally liked that it was um, Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. I couldn't believe how good his acting was. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, he's that, cool. Um, that was yeah. a good film. Really good film. Highly recommend. Viggo, Viggo Mortensen? Yeah, Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, yeah he's cool. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't recognise him because he was like a mm. half-fat Italian guy in this um, in uh-huh. this film. But a really good film on racism um, and just what it was like back in the 60s okay. in America, in Southern America. It's good. I'll just check it out. on that, just something funny we have another saying we like saying it's strength culture but it's if you're going to take stims use them so yeah. <laughs> just uh, if you're going to be if people come in all the time they're like oh you've got pre-workout i'm like if i give you this actually go and fucking use it like get in the gym and use it but it's just another <laughs> it's another thing for, for that exact thing if you're going to have three coffees in the morning you better be bloody productive yeah. on the back yeah. end of it <laughs> you're, not, you're not taking you're not using coffee to wake up in the morning that's a that's a lifestyle thing get to bed earlier or whatever like if yeah. you're taking coffee Use it to actually do something. Mm. So yeah, just uh, if you're gonna do something, actually, yeah, decide to do it. If you're gonna play video games, play video games. I need a donut. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's this there's this guilt associated. I think we've all been there where you have this guilt associated with pleasure, with enjoying life. You almost, at least I have. It's you almost feel like, hold on, if I'm not spending every minute, every hour being productive, David Goggins in my life, then. <laughs> Am I re- what am I really doing? What am I doing here? Like I have all these aspirations and goals and this and that. And then you come to realize that, well, at least I have is that, well, hold on. I'm not trying to be a slave to my goals. I'm not trying to be a slave to all these things and aspirations that I want. You realize that, hold on, I can just go for a walk and enjoy some music or I can enjoy a movie or this or that. And I can be really present in the wide diverse experience that is life and i think we have a responsibility that we can teach that onto our clients and athletes that you know you know what your sport is really important whatever it is but it's not the be all end all are you actually taking some pleasure and enjoyment if that's important to you out of life or are you just a slave to your own system I used to be like that with um, reading. I used to think I have to only read nonfiction and when I'm reading, yes. I have to be learning. And I've started reading fiction again and especially before bed because it just, I read like fantasy fiction. You sort of get lost in this other world and it puts you to sleep. It's very like relaxing activity to do right mm-hmm. before bed. And I've started to really, hang on, it doesn't always need to be reading nonfiction and learning. Um, yeah, and there's other ways to learn too. I can listen to podcasts or audio books during the day. So I found that I balance now. I audio book and walk because that gets hits both. You know, kills two birds with one stone. But before bed, I read fiction, and it's nice. Just the, What's your favorite, Charlie, uh, in, the, in I, the fantasy world? 
so well, I'm reading the Gentleman Bastard series at the moment. So I'm in the second book of that. Um, but then a recommendation that I'm going to read next is The Name of the Wind, Patrick Rutherford, which was uh, recommended by Luke Tulloch. Um, and ironically, I was in a bookstore and, and I picked it up and another guy was like, that's a really good book. So that's the next one on my list. I did read the first Game of Thrones, but I found because I watched the season, it just all the plot points, like you already know what's going to happen. So it doesn't yeah. have the same effect. But um, really, really enjoyed that first book, The Lies of Locke Lamora in the Gentleman's Bastard series. It was really good. The Gentleman's Bastard. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you read any fiction at all? Um, yeah, I mean, my, Lord of the Rings is my all-time favourite. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Rings and, and anything written by Douglas Adams are my two, two absolute go-tos. Um, but I'm reading, a friend of mine gave me uh, 20 books by Douglas Copeland because they were getting rid of them and I'm just starting to read my way through them. I'm not even sure I like them that much, but fiction's just so soothing that you just, you know, uh, it is. gets you out of your head a little bit. And, uh, it's really good before bed. But now I've actually started to learn a fair bit um, from the book, The Brain That Changed Itself, the benefits oh, that? on, yeah, really good. So I listen to the audio version, but the benefits on focused activity, so reading, even focused learning, like learning an instrument or a language, the benefits it has on like neurogenesis uh, of the brain and neurons and how that affects like Alzheimer's and dementia in um, like the preventative causes of that long-term. So even just reading fiction itself is, is almost, I think of it like training for the brain. It's like healthy for the brain. Um, so it doesn't always need to be reading to learn. Like you can just be reading for enjoyment. What, one of the, funny you mentioned, remember the, the uh, brain training app that I play around with, uh, brain yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well the all what well, the kind of the star of that book dr robert merzenich um he's actually the owner part of one of the owners of the company that uh posit h posit science that makes brain hq um so, ah, okay yeah yeah really? nice. I, from the brain that changes itself yeah, yeah yeah i can never say his name it's a long, long name i think Merzen yeah no, yeah but it's, that is a really good book. I um, Ben yeah. Bukowski recommended that on his podcast, and he said everyone who's into training, fitness, or just life should listen or read that book. Um, and I, it's a really good book. I've just listened to the audio version, which I found really good. Mm. Mm. I've read it twice. I need to go back and read it again. It's like <laughs> again, third time. I want to buy the hard copy because I, I constantly want to reference it, mm. and. Um, you know, when you listen to an audio, it's a bit easier when you've got a book to put like sticky notes and stuff in there. Yeah, you highlight like a bandit. That's it. That's it. <laughs> That's no, what you're saying, Charlie, about reading fiction before bed, that has been the best thing that I've ever done to help my sleep latency. So, time to sleep. Like mm. red light reading, like it's, man, it's like a magic pill. It's really it, effective. It's really, really good. I found like TV or PlayStation before bed, you just go to bed wired. But you're the stimulated. Brain, yeah. Yeah. It's dopamine overload and oh, yeah. lights and sensors are going off, but reading and fiction reading as well. Cause it's just more of a story. Yeah. I think about like, a, well, it's a bedtime story. So like, mm. you know, as a Good child, point. you get, you get read a bedtime story to go mm. to bed and just yeah. the adult version of that. There we go. Yeah. We're, all, we're just baby adults now. We're still just that's, children in our minds. That's it. Um, let's. I want to. This is love. This conversation. It's all over the place. Um, which, which we love. But um, I wanted to. We got a question from uh, Matt about. We were talking about this training dose before, and Matt got. Matt asks, how do you guys find and monitor the idea of optimal training dose for a client? In regards to frequency, intensity, volume, is it mainly subjective measures like RPE or do you have another extensive process on top of that? Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take this to start. Um, so, again, we like literature sort of guide our decision-making process. Um, and the literature has some really, for strength, again, I'm, I'm going to stick with strength here. This is our wheelhouse, but um, I, I, so I won't talk about like speed training and speed volume dosages and all that sort of stuff. But uh, when we discuss uh, strength training, uh, the literature has some really good starting points for a lot of program design and uh, like how much stimulus to give through a training week or a micro cycle. And uh, generally we look at two times frequency for most big lifts or main movements or main muscle groups. So like a squat program, if you want to get better at squatting, a good place to start would be squatting twice a week. And that could pretty much be said with most 
things within the gym. If you want to get better at chin-ups, you're probably going to start with doing chin-ups twice a week in the week and obviously be just logical in how you space that out a Monday and a Thursday and leave a couple of days between them two or whatever, something like that. Um, in terms of like uh, total or, or starting volumes and when we discuss volume, volume for us is hard sets per week per movement or muscle group. So again, if we use those two examples of, of squatting and chin-ups, if you want to get better at squatting and chin-ups, we're probably going to start anywhere between sort of like eight to 12 sets within the week. Um, so that would be split across the two training days. Um, but then moving forward from there, the literature sort of breaks down because as Charlie's alluded to, and as we consistently and always educate on, like each individual is an individual, like everybody is an outlier in their own sort of experience and in their own context, they're going to have certain things that they can handle really well and other things where they don't handle very well or, or higher intensities or higher volumes or higher frequencies or anything like that. So we use the literature as a starting point, but then the direction and the, the amount that we progress all of a sudden becomes like an individual experiment per client with us, uh, where we take on both objective and subjective data to see how we're actually progressing and, and moving through the training experience. Um, so a lot of the evaluation process uh, we heavily rely on subjective stuff like using um, RPE-based systems or formalized data weekly. So the same questions we ask in our weekly check-ins to make sure that we're seeing consistent trends of, yeah, I'm feeling good, things are feeling productive, I'm having successful sessions, and that's where we progress forward from there. Or, hey, yeah, my shoulder has now been playing up for two, three weeks on end. I think I'm doing too much upper body pressing work or I'm, I'm not doing enough uh, maybe like reaching patterns or something like that to strengthen some of those other muscles or, or whatever. So um, we have good starting points with the literature. It helps us understand where to start. However, progressing forward quickly becomes an individual experiment. And yeah, we could probably make some, some probable uh, predictions on when to add more and when to take things out. But for the most part, we're going to be using um, the subjective data from our individual athletes and trying to educate them to become a self-aware beast and learn how to analyze themselves and learn how to, to unpack their own experience so that they can make a more informed decision and at least give us the data that we need to then guide them through a progressive training program. Well said. Yeah. I definitely think um, to add on to that though, the big, one of the big things with skill uh, with strength and especially early on is definitely the skill side of it. We often talk about building muscle, building, but like skill is a massive part of that. And more, so if you are focusing on something, improving someone's skill within a movement, um, a, a, a good way to get a better response is to expose them more frequently throughout the week. So it might be three, four times a week. Um, to a certain movement, but that doesn't necessarily mean on each day it needs to be really hard, challenging sets. They might be quite easy sets with a tempo, just getting them fam familiar with the, the skill and the movement so that we're, you know, ingraining better motor patterns into um, the brain. So that, that can be a reason for increased frequency. But then obviously, like with my guys, like the powerlifters, as you get closer to comp, we're probably going to drop the frequency because we want to we want to drop volume and really prioritize the intensity. Um, and we know that those two variables are inversely related. Um, quick question to you guys. I, I really like the idea of just counting the hard sets per week. That's that's really smart. Uh, Real quick, what's the definition of that? Was it above an yeah. RPE of... So we use above eight? an RPE. So in, uh, so in, in, in the literature, it's RPE5. Oh, oh. We don't educate on cool. RPE5s. We believe it's too hard to gauge an RPE5. Uh, and we run this experiment in every uh, in every uh, in person seminar we do, and we discuss RPE based training. We get people that are always never used RPE based programming, and, and and we try to get them to analyze sets that they're comfortable with. So we choose an exercise. Most of the time, it's the bench press. Most guys that come to our seminars have done bench press. They just never done RPE based bench pressing before, uh, and we start to just get them to warm up and start calling sets and you become far more accurate closer you are to failure for obvious reasons. So we think an RPE five is a little bit too distant from true proximity to failure. So we actually use an RPE six, uh, which is roughly four reps in reserve. If you're going to use the repetition in reserve method um, for hard sets, but by the literature standpoint, it's actually an RPE five. Um, so yeah, um, so we use hard sets per week above an RPE six. In terms of, percentage of one rm load like because i could do i could do 50 reps with an empty bar and call it rpe6 but that's not really a working set from a neural intensity motor unit recruitment point of view 
what sort of percentage loads are you starting? Like how many sets into your warm up are you starting to have people really think about their RPE? Because we have athletes, they'll do like an ascending pyramid kind of thing. They'll start with an empty bar, loosen up, then they'll do maybe 60, then 90, then 120. Then they're starting to look at, okay, I'm, I'm heading to like 160, 170 today for our bigger, stronger athletes. And they're going, oh, I'm heading to that. When are you sort of starting to count the sets as they ramp their way up to their heavy stuff? And take us through the sets. I'm super, I'm super curious, of, say, the bench. Like, what is what set one through to set six or whatever it may be? I'm, I'm really curious. So, um, the sets start as soon as we get above an RPE six. It's, it's literally... So, if you're... If you're if, so, if someone comes in the gym, all right, we've got bench press today, four sets of five, at, let's just say an RPE range of seven to eight. And they do their... They're going to be somewhere around 100 kilos. They do their last warm-up at 80, say, for a triple... And they're like, all right, my next set is going to be, I believe my first working set. They put 95 on the bar and they hit it for uh, the prescribed reps, but it's an RPE six. If that's more than one point away from our prescription, to us, it's a warm up set. We don't count it. Um, we don't count it until you hit your first prescribed load or prescribed RPE. So your next set, that 95, all of a sudden that wasn't enough. We need to understand there's going to be a little fatigue accumulated from that, but we need to go into our working load. So we might just add five kilos to the bar. So you um, wouldn't get, count the 95 kilos. That wouldn't count no. as a set, even it though it was RPE6. It would, it would, it would, if our prescription is above an RPE6, no. If it's a 7 to an 8, no, we wouldn't count it. But we'd use that set to guide the decision-making on the, on the following set. Mm. Fantastic quote from Charlie is, current performance dictates current performance. So what you're doing in your warm-up sets will tell you where your working sets are going to be. If your warm-up sets are moving like trash, they're not feeling good, you've got some external stress, that's going to tell you that, all right, my working sets are probably going to not feel as good uh, as a result of what's going on there. But if you're going through your warm-up sets and everything's feeling fantastic, we can probably push the load a little bit more. So you're going to use the current perform performance through the warm-up sets and that maybe that final warm-up dictate the load selection moving forward. But we have a whole bunch of different RPE strategies. We use uh, RPE ranges like six to sevens, sevens to eights, maybe even like a larger bracket for an isolation movement, maybe like a seven to nine for like a bicep curl for an RPE. We have ascending sets similar to what you guys do, but instead of it being an ascending set of 100, 110, 120, and then back down to 120, we call it a seven, eight, nine, and then a D. So it's, it's literally all of the standard strength training strategies that we've all used and we've all experienced through all sorts of programs and coaching strategies. It's all the same, except we just don't put the load there, we let the athletes select the load and we try to guide them with how they're feeling and that internal load sort of um, perception of what's going on. Yeah. I think so. that's a big thing that we haven't really touched on is the external and internal load. So like training is, is stress, but it's the external load of what's happening on the bar sets, reps, weight on the bar isn't really what the body understands. The body understands that stimulus once it's, it's on the inside. Um, and so then we talk about Jamie, the acute to chronic workload ratio. Like if you're yeah, ad adjusting loads and volumes too excessively, that's when you potentially will run into some issues, but like two and a half kilos here, there, like it's, it's not enough of a change for the body to really be like um, the register. Like uh, yeah, that was oh, 177, wow. not 175. Like the body has no idea. Yeah. Um, the internal load as, as is, is what drives adaptation. It's the internal reception and perception of the stress that's applied to us. And the important thing to consider, and this is why we love RPE and we'll educate on RPE until the cows come home, is because external load, what we're actually applying on the barbell sets, reps, the objective variables within a training program, um, they are influenced so heavily from your external or non-specific stress. If you break up with your girlfriend and come into the gym, that three by five at 80 kilos, which last week felt like uh, quite easy, all of a sudden is not going to feel easy today. You're going to be in your head. You're going to be, all, and all of a sudden the internal load is completely different. We have a completely different individual here. So this is eight. It's like the 80, 20, 80, 80% 80 of the time we know the type of athlete that's probably going to walk in the door and we know how much, and we probably could prescribe load for that. But to us as a coach, we prefer to give the tools to the athlete to say, when I'm in one of these 20% days where I'm either above my perceived performance or below my perceived performance, I need to be aware of that and take advantage or minimize the risk of that session. And for us, that is, it's just constantly educate RPE and self-awareness practices to get this athlete to actually understand 
when to push and when to pull back. Uh, because with, in our space especially, we don't have full control of every session with our client. They, we do a lot of online coaching. Uh, also, just the way our gym's structured, I only coach eight hours per week on the floor. Charlie does about 12. Uh, the other coaches only do about 14 to 16 hours on the floor. We're not there all the time to constantly hold the hand and, and do all that sort of stuff. So in our clientele and with that, in our context, we need our athletes to learn when to push and when to pull. Um, where in a, in, a, in a sense, for like a junior athlete, I probably wouldn't give them uh, <laughs> that, that opportunity. I'm not going to give a 14-year-old kid that's done two months of training and be like, hey, man, this is the RPE system. I'm just going to be like, hey, man, here's 25 kilos. Go and do it for somewhere between eight to 10 reps. If you feel like it's getting too hard, just stop. Like that's, that would be my education of RPE. Like if it, if it feels hard, just stop. Don't do anymore. <laughs> so it's context dependent and it's specific, but within a powerlifting setting, you, you, should, you should learn that skill because it is, it is extremely valuable across all fields for strength application and hypertrophy as well. So, but in, in, uh, in the context of uh, 50 rep set, um, as long as the proximity to failure is there, uh, that is still like the, we say proximity to failure is the stimulus and it doesn't matter what you're actually going for. So if you're thinking about speed training, proximity to failure, i.e. the fastest you can run is what stimulates you getting faster. Um, if you talk about power training, it's putting as much power into the ball as possible. The proximity to failure is power output, the amount of power you can apply to the ball. When we talk about hypertrophy, proximity to failure is your ability to tolerate internal stress and that metabolic stress and that metabolic stuff. If we talk about strength training, proximity to failure is intensity or your RPE or your repetition reserve. It doesn't matter what outcome you're looking for. You're always looking for proximity to failure. Training should be hard. It needs to be hard to disrupt the system and to do all that sort of stuff. So that's why we like RPE because it educates the, our athletes within our context of strength and hypertrophy that, hey, these are the feelings we want you to feel. And if things are awry, minimize. If things are feeling great, uh, be proactive and push that a little bit further. So Have you guys the big thing, the, um, the Learner Lab podcasts? No. Oh, you're in retreat. You're going to love it. Short 20 minute bites. They're, they're amazing. I'm making a list here. Uh, and Learner Lab. Learn Lab, really good. They, they, they used to be called Train Ugly, and they've changed, they've rebranded themselves to Learn Lab. And um, they like talk that. about uh, they talk about desirable difficulties um, yeah. as as a key concept, and that's proximity to failure. Like you want to yeah, be like, knife edge, yeah, yeah, yeah. You you need to be in that zone, that RPE five or six plus, and like speed training is redundant unless you're pushing for maximal output of speed mm. training. Yeah, you can do all the technical A skips, B skips, and all that sort of stuff that you want. But if you want to get faster, you, you got to run fast. Like you have yeah. to fucking put put the feet down and, and time your sets and get a person next to you and make it competitive and put that competitive edge on. Until you get into those situations, you're not mm -hmm. getting faster. I'm sorry. Like if you want to jump happen. high, you got to try and touch the ring. You got to try. Yeah, and exactly. Put that external it. thing there for you yeah. to get to. And like once you touch it, move it up. Like move that meter. Like yeah. it has to be, but it has to be constructive in that sense. And that's why having a coach and having a progressive <laughs> plan is so important. I've gone on a proper rant here. I'll shut up. For a <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's it was valuable though, Jamie, you explaining the proximity to failure bit because yeah. um, training to failure is often perceived as, well, I've just got to go until the bar crushes me on the, on the you know, if I'm benching, I'm just going to go until the bar falls out of my hand, crushes me and my spotter has to save me. And that's failure in terms of technical failure or, or actual maximum capacity, yeah. but it's not actually failure in terms of like for speed training, for example, Training to failure in terms of running until you fall over is a yeah. horrible not the strategy. Answer. Yeah, it's not the but answer. Pushing towards your absolute threshold is the correct strategy. That makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Important it's way to clarify same, that, that yeah. statement. Yeah. It's the same with uh, Luke Tullock. We're, we're a big fan of Luke and, and he's been fantastic for us in now. Uh, just understanding some of these concepts as well. But he also, he, he applied it in the, in the, in the realm of learning. Um, and, and, he, and he spoke about like, until you're struggling and like rereading paragraphs and like, Google searching and watching different videos on like exercise metabolism and trying to work out like whatever pathway of metabolism it is for one example, until it's difficult for you to grasp that concept, you're not learning. If you're just reading and it all just makes sense and it's, it's like, that's no longer learning. That's not a learning phase anymore. It's only when learning gets learning. difficult. So it's, it's, it's even, it's even with like cognitive sort of expressions as well. Playing guitar, if, 
if, if, if it's easy for you to play the guitar, you're not learning anything new. It's not until you're trying to change chords and learn different chord strategies and all that sort of stuff. And you've got to repeat and repeat and do it again and do it again, sleep on it, come back the next day, that process as well. So things need to be somewhat difficult for you to actually progress forward. You need to actually stress the system. Yeah. I've been doing that. Yeah. I've been doing that with my guitar. I've been, um, cause I've been learning like a, bit, a fair bit of music theory. Um, and I, I, there's some stuff comes up. I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? But then I just find them more and more. And then like a week later, it'll click. I'll be like, Oh, that's what they meant by that. And then it just starts. And slowly the pieces of the puzzle start to connect. And I've, it's, been very humbling for me because I've trained for so long strength training. I feel like I'm, you, you, you get to a point when you do something for so long that you can't remember what it's like to be bad. Mm. And so then you, but learning guitar and learning music theory has made me empathize with like a full, like a, a beginner client again, like what it's like for them to not understand RPE because all we've spoken about for the last two years is RPE. And for me, it's like, it's like speaking English. I just make sense in my head. I understand it. But for a beginner walking in the gym, I can now sort of understand how it could be so foreign to them and not make sense at all because I'm experiencing the same thing with, with guitar and music theory at the moment. Mm, that's cool. I wonder, because we talk a lot about RPE. I know you guys use that tool for years now. Durham, Jacob, do you, how do you measure proximity to failure do you guys order regulated to use percentage one rm do you have another system do you combine them together how do you guys think about measuring intensity in that way all right prepare to be underwhelmed um, <laughs> <laughs> so we've always liked the idea of what we really want is we want people doing a five rm weight for a triple that's really that's the epitome of doing 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 a heavy weight but leaving a little bit in the tank that's going to get most athletes really good results. Um, so we're just kind of chasing how we can be around that, that sort of area. So lift, lift heavy things that you can't do from a lot of reps um, and leave a little bit in the tank for next time. Um, and I mean, I was, I was very lucky. Uh, I kind of grew up in a powerlifting gym and I got to see really good lifters and, and just see that the, the, over the course, I was in that gym for 17 years. So I saw people fail. I saw them do well. And, but I just saw more and more like there's this thing where there's a sweet spot where you're training hard enough, but you just leave it a little bit. And when you come back on Wednesday, uh, you can train really hard again. Um, and so we just, we kind of pursue that in our own, in our own way, I guess that's, that's about as uh, fancy as we get with that. It's, it's more of a philosophy that you teach and educate to your athletes and clients. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, an, it's an informal, it's an informal RPE system effectively. That's, so we, yeah, that's literally it. We haven't gone to the, the point of teaching numbers and stuff like that. So it's, it's a lot more coach's eye. So we'll be watching and we'll, we'll be we'll be spotting and you'll feel the squirm and you can kind of see, you can see when it moves slower. And so it's effectively, it's combining sort of what we know about velocity based training, what we know about RPE training and just making it a little more informal and trying to get the, and then having good conversations and asking good questions of our athletes to try and get them to then own whether it was difficult or whether it was easy as opposed to just relying on us, oh, should I go up? Well, what do you think? How did it feel? Um, and so then having those conversations, well, it felt good. All right, well, let's go up, but let's drop the reps back or let's do that again for the same reps, lock it in, then next week we'll go up. So it's, it's the same sort of thing. We're, we're reactive. We, we do um, opportunistic periodization in that we're flexible because you know, the athletes might have tournaments on the weekend. They might be ramping up in their off season. They might break up with their partner. They might have exams. But again, external stresses are going to play a role as well in terms of which athlete shows up on the day. So we're very opportunistic each session. And then, yeah, we're applying those things. We do a little bit of VBT. Um, we'd like to do more of that with our athletes, particularly our more advanced athletes, because we're doing a hybrid of power and strength training with a lot of athletes. With a lot of their stuff, there's a lot of accommodating resistance, um, Olympic lifting derivatives where, where appropriate for our older athletes. Um, and then we're trying to get some sort of, you know, maybe, maybe it's plyometric training in, involved in their strength work as well. Um, so it's pretty blended. Um, we're not we're we're not married to any system. We're kind of dynamic, Jamie. Um, uh, this actually is is perfect for something that we've really started to hammer, um, particularly through uh, our recent RPE based programming education thingy that we did. But um, I think where a lot of people go wrong with, or not go wrong, but why they're scared of RPE training is because of the repetition in reserve. Um, 
context of strength training powerlifting that a lot of people use it with, um, which is is mainly through Mike Tashira and, and the reactive training systems uh, influence on powerlifting. And that's sort of starting to make its way through the rest of the strength and conditioning industry. When we discuss RPE training, we're using the repetitions in reserve strategy. But the important thing is RPE training is probably how, I'm, I'm, I'm confident in saying it, is probably how 100% of people start training. They enter a gym, they pick up the 10 kilo dumbbells, they do some chest press and they say, that was easy, I'm gonna go to the 12.5s. Or that was hard, I'm gonna stay here. Like it's, for us, the RPE system is just trying to create a language mm. that we have consistent across mm. the board with all of our members and all of our clients. And the easiest thing for that is an objective scale from 10. Whereas you guys are using an RPE based system, but it's yeah. more so that felt good, that didn't feel good. But the education that you have with your athletes, but also the, the words that you select from a coaching standpoint, I'm sure is consistent mm -hmm. across the board. And if Durham is coaching, let's say Bill on a Monday, and Jacob is coaching Bill on a Wednesday, the education of that felt good, let's do more, or that felt a bit hard, let's pull it back a little bit, will probably be the same. Because Very core similar. advantage, yeah. yeah, exactly. Because core advantage is a, a it, it, it's core advantage. It's not Durham's training and Jacob's training inside the same facility. It's we are core advantage. We use the same systems. So right. the RPE from a repetition in reserve is just an objective quantification not even quantification it's just it's trying to create an objective system from a subjective feeling like that's literally at in its crux what rpe is and that's a perfect example of an rpe system that's not specifically repetitions in reserve which is really important because everybody has the skill set in them to know when something is too hard or too easy and when to push and when to pull and a good coach and a good coach client relationship will take advantage of the good days and and sort of minimize those bad days as well. So um, it is, in my eyes, we use the same system. Yeah, um, we do. And, and we still, and yeah, we still yeah. do talk about the two reps in reserve stuff. Yeah. Do, do, how many chin-ups do you do? Oh, well, I want you to leave one or two in the tank because mm -hmm. they're going yeah. to an 8.5. Yeah. 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 And that's just us saying, go to an 8.5. Yeah. Like that's literally, yeah. So we just have 8.5. You guys just say, leave one to two mm -hmm. in the tank. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. Everybody uses RPE. They just don't know it because they 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 believe that the RPE system is this repetition in reserve, uh, uh, powerlifting based thing. When in reality, RPE is just rate training of perceived exertion. Understanding how hard you're training. That is what RPE is. So, um, yeah, we are biased, but I think the bias has some. No, <laughs> it has some good stuff in it. And, and look, when people come and step into our gym and they see some <laughs> athletes um, that you would, to look at, they don't look like strong athletes. Like they're just like pretty normal people. Uh, and then you see them start to move weights and jump and so forth. And it's, it's the system we've used. It's, it's just that leave a little in the tank and apply that consistently over a couple of years and you'll get, you'll become a ninja. You'll be amazing. That's it. Um, That's it. And yeah, it's, 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 it it's not a difficult process. It's no. really not consistency and sticking to it is the difficult part which is psychology which is why we all say we probably wish we did psychology degrees oh. um but it would make everything so much easier yeah, understanding how to motivate physio. yeah i did yeah, it like i had physio. a choice <laughs> i chose sociology over psychology in my arts degree and yeah. that just burns at me like sociology is <laughs> useful because it's culture um yeah. but i would have loved to have uh, understand yeah the yeah. human yeah. the human psych psyche a bit well better. on that that's a that's a great kind of vehicle to get to the next point naturally um fuck. well first of all you know are you guys good to keep going and chat a little bit more yeah I'm yeah back. definitely I'm, I'm enjoying it awesome awesome well on, on that point i mean speaking to brett Contreras a couple of weeks ago he, he's kind of that's his maximal point of understanding the psychology of people change behavior um and how to implement that for coaches and clients. What I, I try and think, like it's probably one of the biggest things, like early personal trainers, guys that we teach, um, and to become a personal trainer, like miss that that art of communication, the art of coaching. And what do you guys think is the biggest missing link with the psychology aspect of younger coaches and personal trainers that you would tell them? I got it. What is um, it? I think it's understanding what the you experience is for the athlete. So what is the, ex if I'm coaching someone, 
uh, what is the Durham McInnes experience for that person I'm coaching? Because if you don't have your head wrapped around that, nothing else is going to go, go very well. So you need to understand them what they want, but you also understand within that context, what is it like being coached by you? Um, and all of a sudden, if you start thinking about that, you're going to start calibrating what you do and getting a sense of what that person needs and what you're delivering. Whereas I think uh, it's, it's so often in the young, young days that coaches and trainers are just so excited uh, they really can't see what the experience is like. They can't uh, step into the shoes of, the, of their athletes. I think that's, that's huge. Well, I'll, I'll add a layer to that. Um, I think probably the biggest mistake that uh, newer coaches or, or, or beginner PTs or all that sort of make is believing that the client wants all of your information yeah. at once. <laughs> um, <laughs> or... or but I know that it comes from, more than likely it's probably coming from a place of insecurity and, and, and thinking in the head that oh, I'm new to this. I've got to try and show my worth and show my value to this person. But then what it ends up from the other, from their experience is just word vomit, yeah. leaving you and just <laughs> shrouding them. So uh, and they probably, they're probably not picking up anything that's going on. So um, the biggest thing is what to say and when to say it is, is how we, we educated on with our coach development program. What not to say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but it pretty much comes, and I, I know Brett, Brett Bartholomew has spoken about this, but it, more often it comes down to actually saying nothing um, and letting the client actually experience what the movement or what the feeling is going through their own process of, of understanding and then asking a question on the back end, like, how did that feel for you? Blah, blah, blah. What do you know? And then working together. But there needs to be that process for the client to actually experience the learning phase almost by themselves. So don't be afraid to say nothing. And, and I say that I'm a very passive coach now where I almost don't say anything. I just ask the client, how did that feel? Ask them what reps felt good, what reps felt bad or whatever. Um, and try to get them to learn through the process as much as it for themselves. And then I just guide them through that. Um, because I think without a doubt, the biggest issue, or not, it's not an issue, but the biggest hurdle that people get over when they first start coaching is you just, I've got to let them know everything. I've got to yeah. let them know that push-ups are activating pecs, shoulders, triceps. Uh, I've got to hold core strong, ribs down, transverse abdominus is holding intra-abdominal pressure, pelvic floor ascending, da -da, and it's just like, what are you You do that for like? every single movement, every single yeah, minute. exactly. And they don't pick up anything. It's just like, what, what is hey, going on? I need to clarify real quick. I think I accidentally said Brett Contreras. I got my Bretts mixed up. I yeah, meant yeah. to say Brett Bartholomew. Yeah. Both good Bretts. Yes. Tremendous. Anyway, just want to clarify. Um, yeah. Brett Bartholomew, yeah. Uh, uh, probably speak less. Just speak less. Yeah. And um, both, of those, both yeah. of those points come from the people first. Mm -hmm. Like, be, be people first. Make sure they have a good experience, a good client experience. They enjoy the process they're not intimidated they understand where you're going you're explaining what you need to so you know you can't just say absolutely nothing you have to explain some whys here and there but you start from why why are we doing it what's the point and then you build in the science and the technicality as they need it if they want it some clients don't want that some clients just want to shut up and let me squat shut up and let me do my running and then you let them go do the thing tweak them as they need to and away you go um, but starting with the person first all right this is a person that means they have a life What's their goals? What are they? Why are they here? And then that makes your coaching. Whereas I think young coaches, no, I was um, just like Jamie was doing these verbal diarrhea before. I was exactly the same. It's like, I know things. They must want to know my things. I must tell them my things. I was like, no, they want to know who you are. Like, they, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So yeah. that's a really, really important thing. It's, it's overused, but it's, it's true. Like, it's and even still, they probably thing. don't care what you know. They probably did yeah. yeah, nine times yeah. out of 10. They just don't. Can you make me jump higher? Yes or yeah, no? Yeah, that's it. They just want to know, will I dunk the ball at the end of this off season? Like that's, that's what they want. You help me get drafted. That's all they want to know. about. A big thing too is um, understanding that what you want is not always what they want. And that was something I, early on, um, I just thought, oh, if you're a powerlifter, you just must want, you would want exactly what I want. But, you know, as I said before, people lifting and doing and do powerlifting, uh, in my instance, for, for different reasons. And you've got to sort of, as a coach, figure out what that is and then tailor their experience to that and not just assume that they want exactly what you want. 
And the other thing is, as Jamie said, um, you know, verbal diarrhea and, and giving them all this knowledge bang on the spot. He's also trying to change everything at once to um, just start. And, and this is something that Jamie, our Puziotis, our other coach, has uh, done a bit of research into his behavior, behavior change. And just starting with one thing and then just layers from there and there. And it, it's, a, it's a longer process than just change all 10 things at once and they're probably not going to change anything. No. I remember you guys talked about that, especially you, Charlie. Um, mm. That was probably one of the, and there's a video you guys made on programming mistakes and periodization mistakes. And one of the yeah. things you commented on was that people change too many variables at once. And so they don't know which variable actually elected the stimulus and result. Mm. Yep. Yeah. hundred um, percent. So that's what I was saying before. Um, well, this is right back to the start of the conversation about we keep the variables sort of fixed throughout the, tr the mesocycle. Cause then you get a better idea of what, is actually working and responding well because the only thing that's changing is the load um, and that will just happen. If something's responding well and we're getting a really good, and this athlete's responded really well to this rep scheme with this amount of volume and this frequency, all right, cool. Now we can sort of, as you said, be that reactive coach and structure their next block in a very similar fashion and then we get another great response. And cool, right, this, is, this might be something that we come back to. This was, you know, two blocks before comp. Um, you know, next time we compete, we might come back to those two programs or how do we and try it again and, um, or something very similar. So, uh, yeah, we try and keep things fixed within the mesocycle because it does allow us to read how the athlete is responding a little bit easier and better. One of the, we got another question, um, from Ramon and she, this is a bit of a very pretty specific question on, on deadlift neck and head position, probably something coaches will see all the time and they might argue about the kind of the specificity of whether you should keep your chin tucked or extended or it doesn't matter. Anyway, her question is um, keeping chin slightly tucked or keeping head up. Is it different for your goals or sport powerlifting, ollie lifting versus sports specific? I'm not going to, I'm going to reserve my comments and just let you guys go. Do they have any implications? I'm, yeah. I'm going to just say, well, as long as the, we have our big rocks um, and as long as those are sort of met, you know, do the thing that is going to allow you to lift the most weight if you're a power lifter. Um, and for most power lifters, that's what they want. They want to lift the most weight. Um, I have like diving into Greg Lehman's work. I'm of the big belief that, you know, the human body, if it can move in a position, it's okay. Um, you know, we have this stigma that certain positions are bad and good for us, mm. but it's the human body. And his belief is that if you can move in a position, you can then train that position and adapt and he's like, how do I know this will happen? Because you're not dead and you're a human. Um, so that I don't inherently see any position as bad. And I, I think that's a stigma that we, we want to try and avoid now in, in the fitness industry and training is that positions are bad because I think that's miseducation. Um, I think there's a lack of preparation is bad to access certain positions. So it's like, um, I know you guys spoke about your tendon healthy, but like, seeing them out and doing pliers without doing the proper progression stream before is, is probably not the greatest idea, but a plyo is bad. No, but maybe not preparing for pliers correctly, then that could inherently have some negative effects. So I think that's how yeah, the lack of pre preparation for certain movements is more so the thing that is probably going to be negative, not the movement itself or the certain positions that the body can get into. And, and just with, um, with the deadlifting specific contest, Charlie's, uh, alluded to the big rocks for us, the big rocks uh, for a deadlift sense is understanding how to get tension out of the bar and into your body. So going through that pre tensioning process, um, we have, uh, we call it alignment, but alignment of the, your core position. So your rib cage and your pelvis should be somewhat stacked. We shouldn't have a big arch or too much of a flexed spine. Um, somewhere in that midpoint is probably where we're going to be able to transfer force the best. Um, and then the, third, the final one is actually learning to push the floor away. Um, so using your legs to generate the force, not trying to lift the bar with your upper body and yank it with your back. So if you can complete those three big rocks, we call the other things smaller rocks. Your specific foot position probably doesn't matter too much. Your toe angle probably doesn't matter too much. Your head position probably doesn't matter too much. It's personal preference. It's what feel, feels good for you in those. But if we can align and get the big rocks set 
pushing the floor, uh, loading and pulling tension correctly, and then also stacking your rib cage and pelvis, getting that core position strong and somewhat stable. That's probably going to be um, what is going to drive performance in the long run more than anything else when we discuss uh, deadlifting. The body has a really like good way of uh, organizing itself to you know for, for 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 strength output to lift the most weight possible. It has a, a very good way of organizing itself into a good position to lift the most weight possible. Um, and I know, so personally for me, like with my deadlifts, I look up, uh, I look up because I don't, this is, I don't have research to back this up, but like, obviously the eyes, I know the eyes have massive effect on what the body's doing. And um, like, you know, if you look there, your body natural, like you look to the corner of your eye, you naturally turn that way. And so for me, I've just found looking up, that's the way I want to go. I seem to feel stronger and everything moves more efficiently and effectively. That's my own deadlift. Um, do I coach that for everyone? No, I, I usually ask the athlete what feels best for you. Um, and that's another thing that you should have athlete input and um, you know a relationship like that with your athlete where you are asking them what feels good for them because ultimately they're the one doing it. And for you to think that you know better being in another body um, is probably a little bit ignorant. So um, I definitely ask them and some people like looking more 45 degrees down at the ground. Um, you know, maybe we'll try looking up and eyes, they're like, no, nah, that feels shit. So I just tend to just put them back to where they feel comfortable. Um, and that would typically probably be my response there. Uh, ask them and, and see what feels comfortable and stick to the big rocks. I love the big rocks. They're so good. Um, <laughs> we're probably a little more prescriptive with our athletes in the sense that we would typically tell them, we want your eyes up a little more because they, um, from a sports point of view. Just, you don't want to be at the ground. Yeah. Just seems to be a little better. So uh, eyes on knees is often a cue we'll give. On, on, in, in the mirror. Eyes on knees in the mirror. Oh, knees, yes, thanks, Jacob. Yes. <laughs> Do not look at your knees. Uh, in between yeah, the I was going to say knees. Is shit. <laughs> um, um, yes, that's, squat. And, and then the eyes on the knees and then they're, just, they're, they're rising yeah. up as they go. Um, yeah. Cool. So Deadlifts. That's, that's specific was, to our gym too because of the mirror position. So yeah. that might vary depending on how close you are to mirror. If you don't have a mirror, it's usually sort of slightly ahead. So in the bottom, you'll have a slightly extended neck and at the top you'll end up being probably about neutral of your deadlift position. So it'll kind of change a little bit. And usually we keep eyes fixed uh, on that point once you've found your point because if you start moving your head around, it creates a that bit of be... a balance issue for people and it kind of distracts from lifting big weights. Yeah, so that would... fast because we want people to we want people to get that bar moving and then slam that accelerator once it's in, once it's in play. Uh, so these yeah. are the different priorities. Yeah, um, that's probably the biggest thing for um, for learners, uh, for, for learners, for new lifters, is probably just find a fixed position and, and keep it there. Don't move around too much. Don't jank your head or any like abrupt movement is probably not great. So just finding a fixed position will probably help most compound lifts. Just set everything and pull from there. Yeah, but like nice. yeah, if you look at um, Bryce Lewis, who has a 900 kilo kilogram total natural lifter in the 105 class in the IPF. He deadlifts and he finishes his lockout with his, him yeah. looking at the roof. Really? And like, a, yeah. So, you know, is someone going to go to him and tell him you're doing it wrong? No, he's one of the best lifters in the world. Oh, uh, no, don't, Charlie, there'll be someone who'll have... There would no be. Like it. You <laughs> said it would be. He just kept his knees a little straight. He'd run a little faster. 100% we'll just, it'll be on the YouTube comments. YouTube. The fucking YouTube comments are a trash <laughs> bowl, man. YouTube and we'll just, sucks. <laughs> yeah, we'll just refer back to, you know, Bryce Lewis is deadlifting. I don't know what he's oh, deadlifting. Shit. That, but, yeah, oh, but imagine if he kept his eyes down, how much more he'd lift. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, we, we, we often say, we're like, Michael Jordan is on the YouTube comments. No, yeah, man. We're... There, just like trash commenting fucking Usain no. Bolt. Straighten your knees up, man. Like he's out there winning championships. <laughs> he's exactly. too busy counting his rings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like winners don't care. Like winners just, they just win. Like, they win. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, get off bro. the negative YouTube comments, please. <laughs> it's because it's anonymous. You can't, you don't know, verify. You oh, can be man. anybody, man. And I saw you guys actually uh, made a video I don't know if it was based off it, but I saw on the RPA stuff, you had some, you made some comments about this person's comments on the RPA. <laughs> and it's like, it inspired though, an educational video. Yeah, well, so it was our RPE for beginners. It's like yeah. everybody enters the gym with an RPA system. It's just not the repetition and reserve system. It's just an awareness of what's hard and what's easy. Everybody starts that way. And somebody came in our comment section and just flamed us they're like i can't believe you guys educate on rpe when it's only good for advanced lifters nobody you train is advanced like blah 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 
And we were just like, whoa, man. So we used it. And then that's how we got into the RPE for beginners thing. But that's great. yeah, the YouTube comment section is just sour. Like everyone yeah. in there is just terrible. It's the worst, worst of all the social medias by a mind. It's, it's either sour or it's full of people who've never made a video in their life telling you that <laughs> they've done it a different way and it worked for them. So you should change your video. Uh, yes. <laughs> so just one time I bought some barefoot shoes and the way I did it worked really well for me. So you should change all the things you've done. I don't know who you are, but this is yeah. a better way to do it. But this is better advice. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. I'm on YouTube. It, um, back in the pre-internet era, it was so different. Because what would happen, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to be able to comment on something someone did, you had, to them them up on, you had to call them up and you had to say, them, hey, I'm interested in what you do. Can I please come to your gym and watch you? And they would say, yeah, you'd make, you'd make a date and you would go there and you'd ask them polite. It was like a dinner party. And no one ever, it was just, that was how people acted. And it was just so weird. So for me, we had that transition to the online stuff. I was like, whoa, people are talking about, what's, what's this? Yeah. You know, it's such a change. Yeah. That's an, speaking of change, um, I, I wanted to ask also, how have you guys go? Gym's now reopening. Awesome. What's kind of the, the major key takeaway point that you got, it's been revealed to you, like a weakness in your system, like a hole in your bucket, whether it's personal and or business that you guys have plugged or plugged already? Government regulations is the first one. Yeah. <laughs> Having to have people in a building is a bit of a business flaw yes. <laughs> in the current world. For sure. Um, our biggest thing was copying, uh, copying strength culture. Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've uh, pivoted our model pretty hard into... Really? Yeah. Look, I mean, you guys know that when I saw how you operated your business, I kind of did the forehead slap and I was like, <laughs> what are we doing? Um, and so we've had a goal of creating more, a more autonomous population. So really having an athlete driven culture rather than a coach driven culture. Yeah. yeah. And the coach driven culture is hundred percent my fault because I'm meticulous. I know what I want. I know what I want people to do. And I just fell in love with the fact that I could just make them do it. <laughs> um, and we've just done a real backflip on that. And it's now let's give them the resources and the tools and set them up for success as their own coach and we just the Sherpa or the mentor. Mm, that's it. Um, and um, so it's, uh, we've only done it for two days, but it's been amazing. Yeah, trying to be less hands-on and more like, let them be more autonomous. How are you practically kind of organizing and structuring that? Well, number one, we're telling them that's, that we're doing this and we're explaining that the why behind that is it actually, it's more fun for you guys. You're actually more motivated when you have autonomy as well. So it's more driven by you. Um, and the good thing is we've got our existing population who actually know how to lift. Like well, with COVID, all our flaky people dropped off and all our hardcore people stayed with us. So we're down to all the true believers who actually know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So these guys have earned autonomy anyway. Um, so it's just a matter of saying, okay, there's no more classes as such. It's an open gym format. Uh, you come in, it's, it's your responsibility um, to look after your warm up, to load your plates, to do everything. In, within your workout, it's our job to educate you as athletes to give you the best chance that you can have to succeed. Um, and which is, you know, straight from the strength culture playbook. It's not uh, me. It's it's Eric Cressy. It's not me right. at all. So there you go. Yeah. we're all just built it. Yeah, I'm I'm glad yeah. that I, it will be sanit. It will it'll have some sanity for you guys as coaches, and particularly for whoever organises the sessions and the session times and all that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. That person probably has a far easier job now because, uh, yeah. I'm glad that you guys, and I know that Woodford has also gone a little bit of a semi-private-ish model as well yeah. with uh, yeah. their, ta their tags. And, and Exactly. So now it's just, you have a coach on the floor who's coaching from this time to this time. You got a fob, you're a member, you come in, boom, you have your program, you get it done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a far, it's a far, to me, it's a far better system, but I, I stole it from Eric Cressy. So please don't give me the, uh, the, um, the hilarious thing from our point of view, though, is, is how embarrassed I am and how stupid I was because for 17 years, I, I lived in that system where you would come along, you would do your thing, and the guys, that, that was the gym I was at, Body World. That was how that gym ran. Um, and then we did all our new fancy thing out here, and this, now we're looking at we're going, oh, this is actually a blend of Cressy, Strength Culture, and Body World. So, we, you know, it's like a clubhouse environment. We build a reception desk. We're making coffees and Love shakes that. for people. Love that. You know? real. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really different. Uh, we're, yeah. we're loving it so far. Um, awesome. and one of the surprising, sorry. 
one must just say, No, you go, you go. I'm I was just gonna. I was gonna say a joke. I was just gonna say once we don't have a twenty person limit, I'd love to come down again. Um, <laughs> For sure. Because yeah. Yeah, I'd love to say it. Yeah, you'll, you'll find a lot of it familiar. Um, but one of the funny things is, is that we we used to run a really regimented warm up, and we were worried about taking that away because the athletes would miss it. They hated it. They're all like, "This is so <laughs> much better," <laughs> you know. Uh, so yeah, really, really interesting. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad. What about you guys, the strength culture? What's what's because uh, you made an interesting comment before we went live, Jamie, about uh, you guys have this unique culture um, that we were able to keep your members were able to stay on right and be loyal to you guys or rent you out the equipment in exchange for it um, and some other things you guys did it's not that they were able to it's they wanted to. right that, How was did the, that, that happen? Was the... that's the dream for like a lot of people they want to create that type of yeah. rapport i don't know i think obviously because we put culture in the name people think that we have the answer of building culture. We definitely don't like, it was just sounded cool. Charlie got it from a DJ who had a, a, a company called subculture and it was kind of like not the mainstream, but just a bit sub and like, that's cool. Let's use strength culture. Like it's not mainstream training, but it's a bit different and it's awesome. So that's how we got culture in the name. But I don't know if there is an answer to building culture. The only thing I could say, uh, with it is that rules and guidelines and boundaries dictate the culture that you're going to have within your system. And that's at every single level. So the rules and the expectations of the manager down and towards the staff is what's going to dictate the staff behavior and all that sort of stuff. And that's something that I've probably learned mainly in the last 12 to 18 months um, with how I manage the staff at strength culture now, but then that has a huge, and I discussed this at our Congress last year, um, your staff are what dictates your user experience. So if your staff are unhappy and they're not having a good time and there's not camaraderie between the staff, all of a sudden your athletes and clients won't see that and they won't replicate that and they won't view that as well. So it's this top down thing that just happens. But once it's set from a top down, I really believe that it then just bubbles up from the bottom up. So it sort of like flips on its head that once the setting and the rules and the boundaries are in place, all of a sudden it's just what we do. It's just what strength culture is. It's a clean gym. It's a respectable gym. It's, it's not the classical heavy lifting environment that a lot of people uh, identify with powerlifting and strength training. It's just not that. Um, like my mum trains there and she does terrible push-ups, and every set of split squats she does, she complains about something, but that's, within our culture everybody knows loris it's just what it is like it's just who we are it's just, so it's i don't know if i have an answer of how you build that thing in there but i do know that it's driven initially top down um but once it's set from your rules and your boundaries and, and just what you guys set as um as this is how we do things here and sticking to that um it, it very quickly flips on its head and all of a sudden the clients and the athletes of the place are what drive that thing forward and they're being welcoming and accepting to new faces and then being um and them setting the rules like when somebody's not doing something correctly they come up and say hey like um clean your bar up or put your weights away or stack that correctly or or hey, don't don't throw things down on the ground like that that's just not how we do things here like it very quickly flips on its head so i don't know if i have the answers for how how it happened or why it happened but we're definitely in a fortunate position from probably three years of Charlie and I being anal about how to stack plates on a barbell has very quickly become uh, just this fantastic community of like-minded driven people who want to be part of the gym. And it's definitely helped us get through COVID uh, in a, uh, I, I, I could say a far better position than I would have imagined um, for some of these other gyms. I'm thinking like F45s that just don't have that sort of stuff or, or good lives and, and all those sort of things that just don't have any real culture from um, from that perspective, I would yeah. imagine. Maybe F45 doesn't fit in that in that in that group. I think depending on the F45 and the community within that, that could probably have a very impactful uh, change on somebody's life. But some of those bigger chain gyms, like your your good lives and fitness first, I just don't think. And also, the twenty person rule is probably crushing them right now. But um, I just don't think that those sort of bigger change gyms can ever really create that because it's just not what it's built to be. You're just a um, number. It, it's a, yeah. Yeah. 
it's like a factory farming for you know yeah. coaches yeah. And they, they don't want you there they make more money when you don't come yeah, right. so it's a bit odd um but yeah I, so i don't know how we did it but it, it definitely helped us a lot um and i'm very thankful for the community that we have because um awesome. yeah we we are nothing without our community that's for sure well said i just wanted to give some space in case anyone had some two cents on that um the oh I, but i wanted to ask you guys what was the weakness that was exposed with strength culture or you personally as individuals that you guys had to address, fix, and get better. Um, and fine. From a from a business perspective, I think we, uh, if you had asked me, I read a book called Profit First uh, by Mike Michalowicz. I read it at the end of last year, and if I had not read that book, the the hole in our business was our finance system, a business finance system, without a doubt. But I read that book, and it completely changed the way I, I had approached the business side of the finance, um, which I think without reading that book, we would have been in a far worse position, but it allowed us a big buffer and a big runway of cash flow that uh, got us through the, the COVID closure. Um, so if you had asked me six months ago, that would have been the whole, but I actually don't think that we had too much that we had identified. Probably the only thing is uh, from our membership standpoint, uh, we had a very cluttered and muddled membership uh, training options as a result of just the, the evolution of our system over the last four years. And it gave me an opportunity uh, to completely wipe the slate clean, set a new standard of what our membership option is, put everybody, all 130 members that we did have, put everybody into the new system. And now it's just an, everybody's on the same page with what we actually offer and the price mm -hmm. of it and what's included with it. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing. And it gave me an opportunity to do that um, from a business standpoint, from a training standpoint, I don't think COVID has really changed that much from us. Yeah. Um, yeah we've been pretty critical of our training system and it's constantly evolving, but um, it was just time off really. So what was that takeaway from that finance book? Um, prioritize profit. Uh, it's the old adage of if you want to eat less, use a smaller plate, um, which I think research has debunked that people don't actually eat less on a smaller plate. They just eat, eat more plates of food. Um, but the concept of eating less of a smaller plate. So he talks about it like a turkey at Thanksgiving. That's it, the analogy he uses. Um, with a business, you could have 20 people that want to eat from this one turkey. And until you learn uh, how to separate the turkey efficiently to allow the 20 per people to eat at enough from that one meal, uh, you're probably the first person that goes to the turkey probably takes the most and it just progressively gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And the people would be um, your marketing uh, budget, your staff budget, your um, in investment into education and all that sort of stuff. So it's really just taking, uh, understanding that your, your, your plate from the turkey probably needs to be smaller at the start to prioritize profit. That's why it's called profit first. And once you have prioritized profit and, and profit is accumulating in some perspective, it's trying to maximize the amount of profit that you're making. But the way I've just bastardized the whole thing, but the way he outlays it and the way that he goes through, it's very practically driven. Um, it was, it is the most influential book on anything that I've ever written, uh, read, written. I definitely didn't write it. What's it um, called again? From Red. Profit First, Mike Michalowicz. Right, um, it's, a, it's a complete system. He gives you PDF downloads that you can, uh, apply to your own business. You can analyze it. Some of the numbers don't match up because it's the American system. The, the GST influences uh, our expense column a lot. So just take that in consideration for Australians. Um, if there are any Americans in here, don't worry about that. But the GST, the 10% does affect it. Um, completely changed everything for me as a business owner. Um, um, yeah. Awesome. Charlie, do you got any uh, two cents um, on... <clears throat> Not so much business, but more so, I think, personal stuff. Uh, balance was a big one. I probably was, um, before lockdown, was uh, wasting a lot of time. Um, just not being as a fish. So, you know, we were talking before about when you sit down and watch a movie, watch the movie. Same sort of thing. I was, like, sort of fluttering my work a little bit. And now I've just, so over lockdown, I sort of put, like, sit down, do the two hours and get everything done. And I was finding I was way more productive and efficient. Um, and then it also gave me a lot more time to spend doing things that I want to do away from the gym, um, like going on my walking, playing guitar, 
uh, stuff. So more so personal, uh, that was more so a personal thing that I've just realized that. And so I've, I've brought that same strategy back now into with the gym being open again, having a few hours on the floor um, to ensure that I have that balance because in order to give myself full, like fully to my clients, I have to like give nourish myself as well. Um, and otherwise I was just feeling a bit burnt out. Uh, so that's a big thing that I'm trying to bring in post COVID to ensure that I'm the best coach I can be for, my clients. Awesome. Mm. Last thing, strength culture, Jamie, Charlie, who, who's the next Australian Ollie champion? Oh, he knows. Who's Ollie yeah, George? George. <laughs> Ollie George. He's my client. I was ironically, he actually had no equipment at all. He had a, took home a couple of dumbbells and he had a 47 kilo dumbbell. He was the one that was like, oh, I just can't be bothered. And he's playing PlayStation and stuff. I was like, go for it. And then and he's, about, your, he's the next uh, guy coming a, up that you guys see. Uh, he is. He he's is. a freak. He, as soon as the lockdowns got lifted and we could have five people over, he started coming and training with me twice a week at, at my uh, garage because I had the, the whole shebang down there. And um, yeah, so he came twice a week, was training with me. It actually helped my training a lot because speaking of motivation, I was feeling pretty deflated and motiva- uh, unmotivated to train in my garage and lift heavy weights. So him coming down on Tuesday and Friday helped me quite a bit. Uh, but he's just, yeah, I just see him being someone, I think he's in powerlifting for the right reasons. Um, and he's got a lot of potential, a lot of potential. Um, so yeah, he had a couple of months, but you know, again, when, you look at the, the grand scheme of things, you know, most great powerlifters are doing this for five plus years onwards, you know, 10, <clears throat> even 10 and onwards. So his two months in 2020 are going to really affect him um, long term. Nah. It also helps that he's built like one of those horse men that just have like horse Big legs. His Big hips ass. and his quads are just fucking huge. So for squatting and deadlifting, it just makes things a bit easier when you've got a whole lot of muscle and torque around the hips there. So, yeah. No, he's, he, he's a great kid. He's funny. a great kid too. Awesome. But, um, and then Chris Yip as well will uh, do some re- like crazy yeah, deadlifts. He did pull 285 for five at... 285 times five at 70 kilos body weight. Ooh. He will... Um, He's definitely up like world record way. So that'll be interesting to see what he does over the coming years. Keep an eye out. And then you guys, Jacob Durham, um, to finish off, just to give people kind of something to look forward to. Like who's the most exciting athlete people should look out for? There's a, there's a couple coming through. Um, uh, Alana Smith. Uh, so she's uh, finished she Division One college career at Stanford, um, gone into the WNBA, Broken into I the picked, at Phoenix. And, and now at, at the Phoenix. Um, and look, she's. I talk about how there's commercial athletes and there's professional athletes. So a lot of professionals are not actually that professional. Mm. Uh, they're just commercial. They're getting paid, but they're not really professional. She's a true pro. Um, her dad played professionally as well. Great human, great, great, great athlete. Just the full package, smart, hardworking, great fast twitch fibers. Um, so she's going to crush it. And for her, the Olympics being pushed back by a year, uh, like she was in the squad. So out. But that's perfect. Um, and the other one's Jock Landau, the big uh, big seven footer. Uh, he's trained with us on and off since he was 14. Um, and it's the same thing for him, where the Olympics being pushed back a year um, is, is perfect. Because he was, again, it's on the cusp. But when those NBA players come in, because he's, uh, he's just. He's Worlds. He was, at, he was at Worlds, but there's world. a few NBA guys missing. Um, but a year longer, and he's been working really hard as well. And he's 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 a true professional. My, my definition of a professional is: do you work as hard when no one's watching as when they are? And those those two guys really embody that uh, that idea. Yeah. Just an inquisitive question: How tall was he at fourteen and sixteen? And massive. He was like six was... ten. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was massive, and he could and he was so big he couldn't even do a push up because he was just so just such a long lever. <laughs> Yeah, um, and uh, now he's a beast. He's really strong, really smart. That's uh, awesome. Knows what he's doing. Knows he doesn't want to get crazy strong. Like he, he only needs to be, you know, like if he's a, if he weighs a hundred kilos, he needs to squat a, you know, a core lift or deadlift a hundred and ten. Doesn't need to be incredibly explosive, incredibly strong, but he needs to be explosive. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, because 
at, at that height, the, the big issue for those guys in terms of career is longevity. Yeah. yeah for every seven sure, for yeah. every seven footer that plays five years, there's one that doesn't make it through college. Yeah. Um, so he's made it through college, had a great career at St. Mary's. He's now playing over in Europe in Serbia, I think it is. Um, mm-hmm. He's on a lot of NBA a lot of NBA teams lists to come back once his contract ends. So hopefully we'll see him in the league pretty shortly. That's awesome. That would have been cool to see him develop from oh, it's great. Man as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's so cool. Yeah. Um, great young man. Very thoughtful, big, big reader, big thinker. Uh, it's nice to see the ones that really are smart, good, yeah. good, good people. Uh, amazing. The question is, is he into fantasy novels? <laughs> <laughs> That's, the question. That's the real yeah. question. <laughs> Harry Potter. Has he, has he read Harry Potter? I reckon he would have. I'll, I'll check. Oh, then that's all right. He can hang with us then. That's, oh, right. that's funny. <laughs> Look, guys, I, I've loved this conversation. Thank you all for taking the time um, in now a much busier schedules. Really appreciate it. Do you guys have any last comments um, for anybody listening uh, or asked of the audience or, or where they can find you? My only comment is uh, you, you're a really good interviewer. Uh, you, yeah. not, not an interviewer, but you, yeah, you, you keep host. the com- uh, Yeah, a good host. That's the, yeah. that's the word. Well done. Yeah. Conversation facilitator. Yeah. Conversation yeah. facilitator, yeah. Appreciate it. I'm just no, I, having it, Alex. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Pleasure. Cool. All right, well, thanks for having us. Um, thank you. My, my one little thing is probably uh, one of my pet projects, The Art of the Reload, which is a, a webinar that we put on for free uh, on our website. So if you just go to Core Advantage, The Art of the Reload, if you are an athlete trying to reload, it kind of gives you the keys to the kingdom. So it doesn't cost anything. At least you're going to be likely to sidestep some of those nasty injuries. So it's a, it's a pretty good reason. Where can people find that? Um, Jacob? Yeah, if you just Google Core Advantage Art of Reload, it'll okay. pop, right, pop right up. You just have to sign up for it. It's a, it's a free thing on our website, coreadvantage.training. Um, for, great for athletes, but also there's a bit of science in there too. So if you're a coach working with athletes, um, it'll give you some good food for thought in how you want to plan the next month to six weeks of your training, I think, as well. So Awesome. Pretty valuable. Thank you. I will give that resource. Thank you guys so much for your time. And uh, I'll speak to you guys soon. All right. Done. Thank you. See you guys. Cheers. Cheers. Who's leaving first? All right. All right. That was awesome, guys. (laughs) Get out of here, guys, so I can outro this thing. All right. Cheers. (laughs) All good. That's all better. They were just chilling. All right, guys, that's uh, Orphic Education's webinar Wednesday number 11. Um, If you guys, I'm going to put it on the screen here. You guys can see that's a core advantage, Art of Reload. It's free. Notice success leaves clues, man. All these guys and girls giving out free resources to help people transition back um, back to their their sports, back to their uh, training and everything. Um, Interesting to see that come time and time again. So... If you guys don't know who we are, we're Orphic Education. We deliver some of the most comprehensive, practical, hands-on certificate threes and fours in the country. We do this every week. We partner and and talk to different health professionals from all over the country. Um, Here's some of the the people we've had on. I mean, this is the 11th time we've done this. So we've talked to, you know, like we talked about uh, Brett Bartholomew. We've we've talked, as you guys can see on the screen, um, guys from Athletes Authority, uh, Formidable Strength, you know, Woodford Sports Science Consulting, bodybuilders, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next week, we got the National Fitness Manager at Fitness First, Tani Duncan. Um, kind of giving you guys a bit of understanding of, you know, what you can expect and how the inner workings of the, from the personal trainer perspective of the industry works. And we're going to have that conversation next Wednesday, live again. All these podcasts and conversations are up on YouTube all podcasting platforms, Spotify, Apple, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to be notified when we do our next podcast, all you got to do is put your name in the form, orphiceducation.com forward slash webinar dash Wednesday. And we're going to let you know when we keep doing this. I'm Alexander Emanuel, Orphic Education. If you guys uh, know anybody or you are interested in becoming a personal trainer yourself and doing some of the most hands-on practical certificate threes and four in fitness in the country, then we might be a good fit for you. You let us know. Otherwise, we're going to do this every week, continually. If you got any requests for guests, I heard Phil DeRue is someone that uh, we got a request for. We might get on in the future, but we're going to keep doing them. Hope you enjoyed it and took some value. 
Royal Education, and I'll see you guys next week.